Bonsoir tout le monde. So as uh, Jean-François said, I'm very happy to be back for the fifth year uh, in uh, Paris. And uh, I will now introduce our first guest tonight, Neil Summer Hours. Uh, so, Neil, you're a type designer and lettering artist. You, uh, you're the founder in 2002 of Positype Font Foundry, but also of Swatch and, Swatch and Kern Lettering Studio. You were born in the Azores in 1972. Um, and you studied graphic design and calligraphy at the University of Georgia in the US. Um, you won many times the Type Directors Club medals, six times, if I'm right. Um, um, and uh, to name a few, um, and I'm very interested to know how are you naming your typefaces. So you won um, medals of the Type Directors Club for Love Script, in 2015, flirt script in 2014, tegaki because you're very much connected to Japan uh, in 2013, for which you were also um, a 2012 recipient for the People's Choice Award at the Morizawa type um, design competition. Uh, I can also name Nori, you won a, uh, a prize for in 2011. You designed more than 70 typefaces, a little bit more, but yeah, let's say 70, more than 70 typefaces, and you give lectures and lead workshops all over the world. Uh, you recently released uh, Courage and uh, Decorata, and you designed Decorata with someone we uh, know in uh, Thai Paris because she was invited in 2016, and it's um, Martina Flor. Um, I want also to say that your type and lettering work is used by many renowned brands all from all over the world, like Facebook, uh, like Revlon, like uh, David Bowie, like BBC, like L'Oreal, that we know, of course, uh, in France. Um, and among all these amazing works, you're also um, um, invested in the promotion of typography. Uh, you were, for a few years, chair of the Society of T Typographic Aficionados, also known as SOTA organization that, um, that uh, is um, connected to the event uh, Typecom. Uh, and I want to mention that there is a great interview on Type Paris uh, website that Gina uh, did. Uh, and um, I was um, uh, very interested in uh, one question, for example, saying uh, the question of Gina was, um, uh, what is your favorite way to start your day? And you answered, <laughs> espresso, sumi brush, pen, sketchbook, silence. We are very happy to tell you that having you tonight at Type Paris is our favorite way to end the day. Please welcome Neil. Thank you very much. Thank you, Veronique. Um, hi. Um, yeah, if I, I apologize if I talk fast. Uh, I am more comfortable in the studio. Mm -hmm. And with small groups and talking, I will get excited and start talking way too fast. Um, so I will try to not. Uh, when, when I realized I have to, I have to get up here and talk. I I struggled with what I would talk about. Uh, I didn't want to just show work, and 
to show some other stuff and then sit down. Uh, since I would be coming and critiquing with uh, the type Paris students all day. So I framed the talk around the students. And I promise it won't be boring because then I will show work and make it fun. But I think many of the things that I need to say to these up and coming type designers apply to any creative. Uh, and I think so much of that kind of goes unsaid because too many people are, are worried about things that aren't important when it comes to practicing their craft. So like Veroni said, I'm Neil Summerauer. Um, in 2000, I had this idea to create a foundry. I gave it a name. 2002, I got uh, where I actually used the name. You know, it's one of those things you kind of sit with. Um, I used to call myself a type designer and lettering artist. And lately, I don't use the lettering artist as much. Um, I draw a lot of type. And I enjoy it. And I will advise on the lettering arts, but I try to apply pretty much everything to type. Uh, when I'm talking to people that are not like all of us here, uh, I have to say I'm not a typographer. And I don't like getting up and talking, so I'm definitely not an influencer <laughs> at all. Uh, people, I've had people ask me, why do I post what I do on Positype? On, on my on my Instagram and it's because many times I just post one letter and me I would much rather spend five minutes looking at one letter as opposed to looking at a bunch of other stuff so I am definitely not an influencer I'm not going to be up there talking all the time but um, what's it mean uh, from my standpoint a type designer should keep people reading and keep them engaged. Um, we can do that with type. And I think many of the type Paris students are starting to kind of understand some of the nuances and the things that can influence type and keep people reading. Um, the problem that I see s young, young type designers now encountering is the, the role. What, what is expected of them and what's expected of them to help w in, in ways that they think uh, they need to succeed. Like in the past, you say type designer, pretty much we think this, you know. Okay, this is Jan Tischel didn't, you know, like, uh, this, and, and, and all of the dread that would be associated with us when we were young and in, in design school and, and watching the professor just tear up what we have, have put together. But now, in, you know, in the past decade, a lot of this has changed. Um, currently, I mean, we have to be an artist. We have to be a linguist, a historian. We have to be a marketing guru. I mean, we got to post stuff. We got to sell ourselves. We got to be a programmer, a psychologist, not only to deal with ourselves, but to deal with the clients, um, a legibility expert, uh, and then maybe then we get to design type. Uh, and I think anybody that is very serious and very passionate about this, these are things and probably dozens more that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but, you know, <laughs> we still do it. Um, and I hope many of the ones that, are, that, that have joined this for this year of a type Paris and, and years to come, they, they will continue to say yes, and, or at least use what they learn to refine their abilities for type to help in whichever field they pursue. So why? We need better representation. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm an old white guy. But I don't need to be the one setting the tone for the type industry, much less the lettering industry. Uh, there's just too much has changed, and we need better representation. Uh, it's just a necessity. Um, but that said, demands on a, a successful type designer are high, but not as high as the expectations you'll have on yourself. I say this 
every time I meet with a young type designer, take your time, period. You, I do not care if you have 10 followers on Instagram or 20,000 followers on Instagram. That doesn't matter. That does not make you a better type designer. Take your time, learn your craft. Be deliberate and experiment. Get out of your comfort zone. Do you go, I like this. I want to do this all the time. No, you don't. You don't know what you're missing. I, you will see in the typefaces that I show for my catalog, I don't do one thing. I purposefully choose not to do one thing because it gets boring incessantly boring if I'm drawing the same type of letter over and over again I lose my mind I keep multiple projects going why so that if I get frustrated with one I go and shift gears and I go to another one so hone your craft and control your narrative okay hey that was the title of the talk see uh, that, see what I did there that's I'm witty I, uh, old guys we gotta have we gotta I gotta have an old joke every once in a while so anyway Find what aspects you enjoy, fight, find like-minded friends, and find ways to inspire yourself, okay? Do not worry about clicks, do not worry uh, about groups. Find people that keep you motivated and not have you constantly comparing yourself to their work, okay? Unless that work is doing nothing but inspiring you and <coughs> causing you to do what it is that you enjoy, so. Um, yeah, I, I'll show some more now. But keep this in mind. And not just type designers, anybody within the creative arts. Um, but that said, this is kind of, I'm going to sh showcase a series of projects, some for personal release, some for clients. Uh, and you'll, I will talk about iteration and the necessity of iterative work about building upon what you have produced and how one thing inspires or leads to another. I find that essential to one refining letter forms to produce type, but also to keep myself, my, my, myself engaged. Um, so from 2000 to 2009, my, I would say my passion became a hobby. Um, that was a long time ago. They didn't have type Paris and really cool certificate programs. They didn't have this stuff. We, all of us were trying to learn how to use this. So if I say like, I learned on Fontographer and I learned how to digitize an Icarus, that should set how old I am. <laughs> Just by saying that. Now we have great tools, either Glyphs, which is a personal favorite, Robofont and others. We have these amazing tools that allow us to better express the letter form that we want to see shown, but we didn't used to have that. And they didn't have YouTube. They didn't have tutorial. We had to fight and learn our way through much of this. Um, but in 2009, I shifted gears. Uh, I pretty much accepted the fact that this hobby needs to be full time. And that was when I say I got serious and really started releasing typefaces and experimenting and finding what I wanted to produce. Again, without social media, even back then, sorry, without social media, even back then, the only way that many times you could get feedback was actually to release something and to put it out there and see how people responded to it and see how it got used. That type of information is important. Even still, when I release typefaces, I like to see how people use those typefaces because that better informs the decisions that I need to make on future typefaces and improvements that I can make. So, um, but for me, I'm talking about things that you love. I love complex systems. I love pushing contrast and mass. Every one of the type pair students today heard me talk mass over and over and over again. I, l I look at creating a letter form as carving something out of stone and slowly whittling away at the mass to manipulate it to produce something that is warm and something that you will, you, you will respond to viscerally. And um, I like keeping a work-work balance, which I know is not the way you're supposed to say it, but I like to keep a balance between my personal releases and the client work that I take on. Uh, that way, 
I don't end up hating one or the other. One helps uplift the other and keeps it motivated. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, I design and develop iteratively. I like each typeface I do to lead to another typeface. Sometimes I will experiment with a typeface and, and go through the process of releasing it because I know I have another typeface that I'm going to do. I, I, Martina knows this. When I released uh, Juicy, which is a layered font, I released Juicy and spent the time investigating how to better refine very complex layered type so that when we release Decorata, which is even more complex, I would be better versed and would have kind of the techniques and the workflow established so that it would make for a better project. Um, and with this, all of the work that I do, I consider it all cyclical. There's no one particular place that I ever start. One thing can lead to something else. The distillation of one project can lead to the execution of another. Everything always ends up dealing with curation. With some of the typefaces that I produce, mm, there I will produce hundreds and hundreds of letters within one grouping and then I pretty much have to curate and decide what needs to go in and what doesn't. I don't put it all in. That's never a good way to think. I try to find the most concise arrangement of type and options for the designer. So, um, okay, no more talking, I show stuff. Um, no contrast, <laughs> no mass, uh, and very complex. Uh, Flirt script, which Veronique mentioned, won a TDC award several years ago. Uh, it was the result of working on uh, a project for Victoria's Secret. Um, so yeah, there's gonna be some underwear shots, sorry. But this project and, and the process of, of producing lettering for the catalog kind of really pointed out to me, because this was 2010, uh, that no one had really focused on making a functional cursive typeface that did not look like a font to investigate how letters actually come together, how they connect, and how you can do it naturally. So, you know, after this project was, was done and all of the, the, the work that was produced and the research that was produced from it, then I was able to try, able to kind of distill it into something that I could turn into a typeface. Um, yep, we're almost through, actually. Yeah, th anybody who has ever dealt with publication, you know exactly why there's so much being tested. Okay, so that work inspired Flirt Script, which this is Flirt Script. Um, the, the unique things about Flirt Script is, is, as we're used to some script typefaces just connecting at the same point over and over and over again, Flirt script utilizes uh, open type features, more specifically just the ligature command, to determine what letter needs to be selected against the letter that's coming up next. So each time you type a letter, it changes so that the actual s movement that you would make as you're writing in cursive comes out. Very nerdy. But I was like, I gotta try it. It's pretty fun. The results I was very happy with. Um, and I still use it, uh, it's great to kind of play around with. Um, now, i see if this video is going to work, which hopefully it will, I hope. This video, we're talking about the whole marketing side. To introduce the typeface to the creative community, I went through downtown Athens, which is a, 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 a city in Georgia, like at two o'clock in the morning where there was no one out and just took a bunch of still photography and then worked with animators that had been working with Apple. This was again 2011 to produce these little vignettes really accentuating the linearity of the typeface and how it moves. Um, this was fun and this kind of started my pursuit on not just producing a stiff specimen of type and expecting people to buy it. 
I wanted them to see it in space. I wanted to see the, it interacting in hopes that it might inspire some type of usage. And I've seen people use this typeface to do stuff just like this, and it just makes me grin. I'm like, well, eh, you, you got the point. So I think it's almost done. That's enough, I'll jump. Okay, so shortly after uh, a series of script projects uh, and other things that I was working on, I had the opportunity to um, produce a typeface for Oculus. And those that don't know Oculus, um, it's the VR virtual reality headset that was started out as um, you know, a Kickstarter type thing that then was picked up by Facebook and you know, it, you know it's everywhere. Um, the, the most interesting thing with them was as we discussed what this typeface was going to be like, uh, it, it matched many of the criteria of, of a typeface that I'd already produced. So at least we had a starting point for the conversation. But the needs for that typeface extended beyond just using it for the brand. They wanted to use it globally throughout the VR headset and that it would be kind of the static typeface that could be that anybody could go to in, in terms of setting up the user interface. So if you can imagine a static headset put on your head, move around, type moving around, what needs to be done to simplify that type so that it's easily readable using the, the various screen resolutions that they had. Um, so again, like I said, it was based off of Clear Sands, which was a typeface that I had re released, I think, a year or two before that. Um, pseudo geometric, very soft, lots of motion. I like warm you know, type. Um, so we took all of that and then started manipulating it within the environment and tested. So if you had walked into my studio at some times, you would see me testing type with a headset on, looking around like an idiot, uh, solely so I could design a font, which was fun. I looked silly, but it was fun. Um, so once we had established how the actual typeface was going to look, then it became a, a challenge to see how it needed to be adjusted to read properly within this slightly distorted environment, which meant put the pushing and pulling of characters uh, and their stroke thicknesses so that they actually resembled even strokes within the environment. So not only was, did, did we produce, or you know, Oculus get a typeface that they could use for branding, but they also rece received a series of typefaces that they could use specifically in the environment so that were adjusted to compensate for the screen that is inside the visor. Once that was done, I needed to expand it. So we drew the Cyrillic and the Hangul, which if anybody is familiar with Asian typefaces, when I say that and you see me cringe, you kind of understand what I mean. <laughs> um, it was a massive undertaking, but was one that I was like, I could do this, this is awesome. I like it. This is great. I'm going to draw. I'm never going to sleep again. And it, it, it literally was 12-hour days for days and days and days and days. Uh, but the result was great because we ended up with a nice uh, branded typeface specifically for Oculus uh, that, that handled both the Latin and Cyrillic. We had screen variants. They even produced a monospace because the programmers wanted that. Um, and we had Korean as well. There is a Japanese cut out there, but I don't, I don't talk about it yet because I'm not done. Um, but basically, <laughs> a lot of letters in nine months. So yeah, but you know now that it's done and they're using it and they're using it well and they're following the guidelines and everything is awesome. You know I see it everywhere, like on all kinds of stuff. And it's really cool to see, to see people follow the guidelines, 
use the type exactly how it was intended is pretty gratifying. And on top of that, the moment your typeface finds its way onto a video game controller, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got bragging rights now. So this, this typeface, so the release of this typeface, the discussion of this typeface publicly led to me being contacted by uh, another group, the Girl Scouts, you know. Now in the United States, these are the young ladies that sell cookies like there is no tomorrow. I have a 10-year-old daughter, and at the drop of a hat, the moment it's cookie season, she can sell 400 boxes of cookies. And I'm like, well, how in the hell did you just do that? And now why do I have to go get them all? Uh, but the Girl Scouts are a really fascinating group of people. You wouldn't think that they would be very brand conscious. But then you start thinking about the extent of this organization. Now, this is specifically for the Girl Scouts of the USA, but I know that this is now, the, the, these typefaces are now being used elsewhere throughout the world. But at the time, the specific focus was on that. And when they came to me, they, they were very honest, and they said they had outgrown the single typeface that they were using for their brand. The realization that that one typeface needed to do a lot more, and they, they wanted to add more to it. So they wanted this type of flexibility. And, I, and when, I, when I started asking what they meant by that, it, I started to understand the scope and the reach of this organization. Not only do they need to appeal to young girls, but they need to appeal to the preteens and the teenagers. They also need to be able to reach out to those former Girl Scouts that support some of their, their more long-term endeavors. So the typeface is needed to embody the personality of the organization and be enough that they would be able to use it without having to rely on other typefaces in the future. So first step, everybody knows this, NDA, non-disclosure agreement. I believe in these things. I want my clients to feel like they can tell me their worst secrets. And then, then I, you know, I don't know. I don't sell them to the Russians or I don't do anything <laughs> weird. But um, for me, it's I want, to, I want to be able to approach the client from the standpoint of I want to know everything that works and everything that doesn't work. That audit is very important. You'll see me mention audit over and over and over again. Okay? That's important. Not only see how they're using it, see how they're failing to use what they already have and what they would like. Um, then, oh, y'all have heard this before. I said y'all. See, I'm from the South. All the type Paris people, define the brief. Know what they need. That's the most important part of a project. As we established with them, they needed a flexible sans serif. They need a matching serif of some type. They needed layered display type because they wanted to use it in different executions, both in packaging and advertising. And they wanted generational scripts. They wanted, I know, you, you, people go, what? Y you produce a script typeface, it appeals to a small demographic of people. So you need to produce typefaces that appeal to different ages. So this generation of girls, this generation of girls, this generation, it needed to hit certain marks. So that was the focus. So third step, sketch, 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 draw, draw, draw. And yes, I draw. I draw my type. I don't just sit in the computer. Um, these, these are the initial sketches that were sent over to the client to kind of get a, a general idea based off of the things that they had told me. Um, from that, they, they kind of developed. You'll see things where pieces are missing. Um, I've gotten so old and lazy that um, I can do this very quickly and know that I've already drawn some aspect of another exemplar and then I can just drop it in so that I have consistency in my sketches to show the client. Within the time frame of the project, the June, roughly June 2015 to August 2016, you can see kind of the development of the sans serif, uh, where it originated and kind of where it ended up. Um, when you compare it, which it became known as trefoil sans, when you compare it to the typeface that they were using, it was hitting many of the marks that they wanted. They wanted something that had a larger X height. They wanted something uh, with, you know, more expressive ascenders and descenders. Uh, they wanted a lot of interesting little quirks within the typeface, and I'll show more about it. 
But that was just one aspect. Once s the SANS typeface was further along, then we started expanding everything else. So we moved from the slab, we, we were started working with those generational scripts, and even the layered typeface. And yeah, the layered typeface was hand-drawn, uh, based off of the original trefoil SANS that was produced. Everything I sat down with the Prismacolor pencil and started redrawing. And then those turned into the actual sketches that were used. So once much of this was produced, we produced focus groups. Uh, for an organization this large, you need that. We had three separate focus groups, three sets of conventional A-B testing, and we introduced it to the local chapters. But within that, many of the things that I introduced into the typeface, people started catching. Um, my daughter likes ponytails. She likes high ponytails. So when I drew the G, I drew it with a ponytail. And everybody started picking up on that. They're like, you put a ponytail on the G. I'm like, yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. I fully admit it. But it was fun. And, and this is something that can translate within the type and give it personality and give it a better ownership within the, the organization that's using the type. Um, this gives you a good idea of kind of the reach of the typeface, uh, both from its thinnest and its heaviest weight. One of the things that they wanted to be able to do was use, the, use this typeface as much in a display purpose as they could because they have so many publications, but they didn't have the time, resources, and money to pay for separate display. So the way to do it is to infuse more personality in the heavier weights and then as you interpolate down, much of the, those eccentricities kind of disappear. They fade to the background. So you can still have functional type that would be used in text settings. And as it goes larger and you're using heavier weights, you get a more I interesting distribution of, of, you know, of form. And it's engaging. One of the other things that I do many times when I'm working on typefaces, if I'm developing a suite, is everything has the same measurements. So you get type designer or graphic designers that are moving back and forth between the typefaces of an organization. Now you don't have to worry about them resizing and rescaling and, and trying to make it fit. They pretty much know how it's going to drop in each time they change to a different family. And uh, type designers, if your customer doesn't know how to use the font you made them, you have failed them. So yeah, I even do that. It's nerdy. But to see how they use it in social media and, and how in print, it's rather gratifying. OK, jumping on. Uh, yeah, 55 fonts, six families. And uh, yeah, so I started talking about that at an organization. And then I got approached by the National Football League. So I went from Girl Scouts <laughs> to big dudes, <laughs> really big dudes that like to hit each other. I was like, yeah, it makes sense. Um, but uh, again, and, and changing, changing what I'm talking about with this typeface, um, when you're dealing with bespoke typefaces, there is always a question of need and want and trying to distill. The client will tell you everything, thinking that you can deliver everything. And many times you have to take everything and then tell them what they actually want. Uh, and that's not because you take a role of thinking that you're better than they are. It's because many times their expectations of what can be accomplished in a single typeface can't happen. Um, but yeah, oh yeah, that mm, audit so that I can generate a brief and then talk about the brief. But within the audit, uh, we pretty much, they had to share they using eight different typefaces and not all of them consistently. And that was problematic. So the idea, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can laugh. Yeah, it was really problematic. But this, specifically, these typefaces that would be produced would be used in their electronic environments, websites, apps, television, anything that was on a screen. So that right there was the first step of identifying that it's just being used specifically for this. Yes, it would be used for print, but the thrust would be to use it on for screens. The result of the audit led to a brief to produce three different typefaces. A SANS typeface, 
one that would be referred to as uh, display eventually. It started out as post. Uh, and the last stats. And, you know, this is a different way of handling it than what was done with the Girl Scouts, but eh, still draw. Sorry. And then, you know, develop iterations based on those sketches. But from those iterations, um, and this, I don't know if I've ever shared this kind of stuff, but this is how I will work with a client. Uh, once we've gotten through the audit and we have started uh, discussing how key things will look, I will then sit down and start mocking up various letters in various iterations and then deliver that to them as PDFs. They are required, there's a whole list of instruction, but they are required to print all of those out and everybody on the creative team is supposed to make notations and marks. It, this may not look like it's different, but each one of those letters are different. And it's, I want to know what they don't like more than I want to know what they like. If I establish what you don't like, then I have the operational parameters to know what you do like and how I can work. So these types of sheets, as the typeface is being developed, is, are crucial to delivering back to the client to get feedback from them, to then distill from that what they need and what they are liking, and then deliver it back around. So all pro sans, the, I guess the heavyweight of the, of the families, uh, was completed with 16 total fonts, eight weights, and matching italics. Um, it was actually hinted in three different ways because it's going to be used in three different types of devices uh, with three different spacing profiles. That way I hit exactly, and they're coded, so all of the IT people know where things need to be installed. It works. Um, and, and it turned out nice. I, I, was, I was pleased with it. Um, so uh, as I completed the typeface and I started delivering things, some of the interesting nuances, because we're dealing with a lot of stats, we're dealing with a lot of numbers, even if it's just used in a text setting, all of the, the typefaces are delivered with uh, tabular lining figures as their primary set. And they all have, they all match the same width. And I thought that was very important and they liked it. I also provided all of the typographic scales to each one of the departments so they know what are the recommended sizes for print, mobile, web, and home use. Home use is a television screen. Um, then we moved to all pro stats. And I was talking to a couple of the type Paris students earlier. This was to be used specifically for small settings uh, where you're delivering a lot of the statistics uh, behind a player. Rather than control or manipulate the X height of the letter forms, which basically saw the opening of apertures, the truncation of any of the feet, anything that would just add to the distraction of the screen and uh, for smaller type, but I also reduced the height of the caps, left the X height the height that it was, so that if they switch back and forth between the two typefaces, they're still getting the same granularity, but now the type itself is reading at a smaller scale. It was kind of a, a foolproof trick, so that if I've got a young designer at the NFL wanting or having to produce things very quickly, I knew that the granularity of the type and how it read, how, how smooth it would read, would match up and they wouldn't have to do a lot of resetting. This is just another comparative showing stats. And then the final eight fonts, four weights with matching italics. Uh, I'm almost done. And then I get to shut up. It's great. Um, bend bars make fonts. The last part of this typeface uh, suite was to do something that would be used more uh, for television. Uh, to deliver content and make it look cool. Uh, we had this idea of bending bars and adding a certain amount of stress uh, within those bars. And I wanted, because I saw what they needed, and they said, we want this. I said, okay, I'm going to give you this, and I'm going to give you something narrower and something wider. Because you're going to want to use it this way, and you're going to go, eh, that's, that's not right. That's, it needs to be bigger. So now they have, they have something a little bit bigger and wider. And this is how it ended up looking 
with 36 total fonts, three widths, six weights, matching italics, and a partridge in a pear tree. Um, but it services more than what was expected. So it looks great for the television in mockups and all the score delivery and all of this, but it's also finding its way into other devices because of these extra widths, and I'm very happy about that. Um, that's somewhat visible. Some of the notable characteristics within the font. Um, and there we go. All right. I'm done. Sort of. Um, I always get a what now. And um, I'll, I'll show the what now. Sort of. Um, it's 396 fonts. Uh, and uh, I, I will release it at some point this year maybe when I get home. Um, but it has been an experiment, a lot of based off of the past three years of work, because that's how long I've been drawing it. Um, anyway, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Neil. Sorry, I talk so much. No, 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 no. It was perfect. Um, do you have any questions? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm just curious, like, how you approach. Oh, sorry. I'm curious how you approach these massive projects. As all of us are getting into the industry, it seems uh, to me personally, it seems really daunting for a client to come and say, "Hey, we need a typeface." So I'm just curious, like, what that processes from start to finish. Obviously, you talked about, you know, you need to do the audit and ask them a lot of questions, but is there anything else that may not be so obvious to us or or how you determine, you know, how many styles it needs or weights or, or all that stuff? Um, or I'm sure it varies per client as well. Well, I mean, the most underlying component to taking on large projects, which I do enjoy, I mean, they are daunting to a degree, and, and they can be stressful. Uh, but the one more espresso. I am my own best barista, OK? Um, but no, seriously, espresso. <laughs> uh, the, for me, the most, the, the most important aspect is making sure that, one, I'm identifying what they need. Because many times you will get clients who will, you know, and I, I gloss over this, but they will come to you and they're like, we need. 6,000 different things. You're like, no, 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 you really don't, you know. And once you start explaining that to them and, and advocating for their success, not your pocketbook, because I have, I have told clients outright, I'm not producing this, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this. You, you don't need to spend the money on this. You need to see how this, I how your customer base or how, you know, how people respond to it. And then if you want to build on that, we can. But then we have data. We know how people are reacting to it. We know how people within the organization are using it. Now we know what to do. So I look at projects from a multi-year standpoint in that regard, and I, and I try to approach it. I may take on a project for, you know, and do it in nine months, but I am working very intently on that typeface project with the idea that there's going to be other things down the road. So how do I set that up for them to save them money in the future? You know, if you, if you approach it from the standpoint of not what am I doing for myself, but how can I best solve, you, common sense kicks in. You're like, you don't need a hundred styles of this font. Yeah, I do large ones a lot of times, but the reason is because of how it's going to be used. Just to have a hundred weights, and you don't have a need for that, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your your employer's money, and and that's going to come back and eat you. It, you're going to lose another project. You're going to lose your job because you wasted money on something that wasn't necessary, and it can't be justified. And if, as long as you have that in the back of your head, where you're trying to keep that person's job, the common sense and the and the recommendations that you make will be more earnest. And you'll actually end up with a better project. Awesome. So. Thank you. Espresso. <laughs> yeah. Earlier you mentioned um, having a work-work balance. Yeah. And I'm wondering what are some things that you do to maintain that? Um, 
for me, I don't work on a single retail release at any one time. I know right now there's probably eight typefaces that are complete and just ready to go. Um, and I'll get around to releasing them either determined by the time of year when that typeface is better received or because I just want to. I'm like, yeah. But I also have other typefaces that I've I've either I work on and they're very quick because I need something to relax with. So I might produce a script typeface based off of like one of my lettering styles. Or I have something large like the thing that I will not give its name because it's still being trademarked. Um, the those are multi year. You you work on them and then you you will hit plateaus. You'll You'll be really, I will get really frustrated with a project or, or I'm waiting for feedback and I need to work on something and do I want to work on this or do I want to work on this? You know, and if I know I've got a few days and I've got time, then I will put that into it. And the shifting, the changing of projects, be it working on a client project one day or working on the client project during the mornings and then in the afternoons rewarding myself by working on a personal release, it makes both projects better. And being able to jump back and forth keeps my eyes fresh. I don't like doing the same thing over and over again. I get bored. Uh, and I think it's very important, especially when you're first starting out, learn your craft, learn what you're doing, and then start taking these projects on. There's no reason why you can't have three different briefs going and have three different typefaces. You don't know exactly where it's going to go. One may take off, and you be become very inspired to finish it, and then you finish it, and as you're finishing that one, you're thinking of another one that you can be producing. There's no reason to wait. Go ahead and start that. Get it down either on paper or, you know, as much as you can digitally so that you can go back to it and revisit it over and over again with the idea of either finishing it, improving, or learning from it so that you can produce another typeface later. Hi. Hi. Um, First of all, thank you for a great talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, a question Nobody fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question that's perhaps quite similar to the one we just had, but um, looking at your client work, it looks like you've had the joy of having such diverse projects and that you know each one brought you something that was so different. Mm -hmm. And then you did jump from Girl Scouts to the NFL. Yeah. So <laughs> um, I was just wondering, in your personal releases, what do you try to seek out in your personal work that your client work can't bring you? Difference. I, um, I l I those that know the type of work I do, I have an affinity for high contrast, l very complex letter forms that you know, I'm trying to figure out how to squeeze as much out of one letter as I can. That, that's something that is exciting. But for me, it's jumping from one thing to the next. If I, if I go, I've been doing a lot of sans serif typefaces, either for clients or either I've had a large release, then my time gets shifted. I will start looking and exploring or researching serifs. Might not be drawing serifs, but I'm doing the research on it so that I can kind of get an idea of what I want to do. Um, there are projects that, you know, I start five or six years ago that are just now getting released because I feel comfortable about, I've had enough time, this has gone through enough iterations, uh, it's time to release it so that I can move on to something else. Uh, knowing that you're about to release a typeface is nerve wracking because you don't want people to come back and say, this is terrible, what in the hell are they thinking? But at the same time, it's also freeing to know that I'm no longer bound by that unexported font, I can release it and move on. And, and that emotionally actually helps a lot. So. Uh, so I, I have a question about, um, so you've done a lot of this sans serif identity for mm. these really big clients. And I was just wondering, um, because like to a non-design savvy eye, the the sans serif font can look kind of all the same. Mm -hmm. And I would assume that every time you take on these massive sans serif projects, there are bound to be some similarities. 
So like, h how do you, how do you deal with, deal with these like sans serifs and still try to bring like a personality to each client? And do you run into the problem of it looking like something that already exists? And how do you deal with that? Okay, that's a loaded question and a really good one. <laughs> one, um, I don't. If if a client comes to me and they say, I want a custom typeface that's like this, or like this typeface, or, and they will slip up and say, we tried to license this font, so we couldn't, so we want to do something that's, uh, uh, you know, that's ours. I politely don't respond. I just ignore it. Or I will recommend that they go back and say, you probably, need to refine what your request was for the license to begin with. You don't need me to do something custom. So I will dis I usually try to discourage as much as I can or make recommendations. If I see that, and I've had this happen a few times and I'm thinking of, and I'm trying not to say something that might hint, but there have been a few times where I've turned down a project and instead made a recommendation to another typeface designer that could do the project because it's too much like something that they've produced. And if they, anybody is going to have a say of whether or not it can be produced, it needs to be the person that's actually produced something similar to that. You know, typically what I try to do is look at what has been used by the client and what they intend to do, but I keep in the back of my head what I have done. Mm -hmm. And if it's something that's based from my library, I don't have a problem with it because if I produced a typeface four or five years ago, I can guarantee you I have a laundry, a long list of things that I would like to change to it. So now I get to a chance to do it and I get to do it for a client. But if, if it's something where I'm being asked to copy, I won't. So it's just, it's just not worth it. Uh, can I just ask a follow-up yeah. question? I yeah. just, um, it just seems like when, like as beginning type designers, we're, kind of at first we're encouraged to explore kind of more um, typefaces that have more character, but it seems like when you actually get into the field, you end up actually working with a lot of these sans serif styles. So do you recommend like make make like having the skills to make one of those as as time like your your like toolkit? Mm, sorry. Um <laughs> sorry I for I another look <laughs> I, I think early on, as somebody learning the craft of producing type, I, I, I say, and I, and I hold to it, explore it all. Find what you like, but it, you know, explore it all. Experiment, learn what you're good at. Just because there's an opportunity to do a sans serif typeface for a client, doesn't mean you're the one that needs to do it. You may be able to do it, but are you delivering the best possible product for that client, or would it be better for you to collaborate with somebody else to produce the typeface? I mean, that's ultimately what it boils down to is, do you think you can bring something unique for that client? And if you can't, responsibly, you don't need to. I mean, you will create more stress for yourself and produce a product that you're not happy with and that you wouldn't put in your portfolio. Just don't do it. Thank yeah. you so much. Hello again. Um, I was wondering, uh, from your teaching experience, hmm. what is the best and the worst of teaching typeface? Or the hardest part of teaching? Hardest part? Or the best, I don't know, both. <laughs> The best is honestly to see, and I was talking about this earlier, to see people at different stages. Because you have, you have some people that have had another class, have had a certificate class, or they're passionate about it. They know their way around, not point looking, staring at anybody. <laughs> and, and they produce type, and you go, this is great. But I have to treat it like it sucks <laughs> so that I can make them better. You know, anything that they do isn't going to be good enough. And that's frustrating because you want to sell them. This is good work, and you can say that. But you know you have to come back critically and push them to do more. 
worst part is having to wait. Many, you know, it's like every one of the every one of the projects I looked at. There's a lot of potential in each one of them, but knowing that you have to wait for them to learn and get have more time and have more confidence and 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 actually produce the product, move past the idea that it's got to be perfect so that they can see what that end result is. The waiting part sucks. I hate that. I'd much rather be. I'd like to be able to speed it up. You know, just so that they don't have to go through that pain, <laughs> but they need to do it. So, any more questions? Yes. Hello. Uh, I would like to go back to the video that you show early, like the, you that you were promoting the script. Yeah. And you did the video, you take the photos, and all this. Uh, did you think that this is the first question? Do you think that? Uh, that effort you put in the marketing and this uh, paid off? Like, did you see mm. that it, it has more response? And second, sometimes I feel like uh, great type designers are not so great graphic designers, and when they're trying to promote uh, their fonts, it feels kind of meh. Mm. And, and now lately I am seeing more about type designers um, asking to studios, like, okay, make the promotion of this typeface, and I want and I wanted to ask you if have you considered this like, okay, I got this typeface, it's really good. It took me three years to produce. Now I need a good marketing campaign or at least a good promotion. I am not talking about anything big, but how do you feel about the marketing about? It, it's it's marketing a typeface is is a skill that I won't say I have. Okay. Um, only only the reason why I say that is because. I see other people marketing typefaces very well. <laughs> and I, I get caught in that same thing. Well, oh, they did a very good job of that one. I'm, you know, no. But at the same time, I need to think about how that typeface is going to be used or how it could be used. And if it's worth investing time and money into promoting the typeface, then I, it, the return isn't the dollar amount but the awareness to the creative community that there's something out there that might be good enough for them to use. Mm -hmm. I got more email from people about Flirt Script because they, they didn't understand how it changed. Because they went to different, you know, some of the distributors' websites and they would type and they, they didn't understand that. And I was like, this is actually something very simple that you can do within OpenType. You just need one feature turned on. And that was more exciting to be able to start advocating and, and showing creatives that the typefaces have more to them. You know, like I was talking with Olga earlier about, you know, creating a set letter form and then building around it so that you have variations. That's crucial to a creative to know that they have options within that typeface and, and to, to be able to teach them that that's important so that they know to start looking for that and they don't settle on an inadequate typeface because they, you know, they think, well, this is my only option, so. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Nana.